uh, first of all, uh, hello and welcome to the Open Glam webinar series, Universal Access to Documentary Heritage in the Asia Pacific. So my name is Andrew Henderson, and I'm the Secretary General of the UNESCO Memory of the World Committee for the Asia Pacific. And I'm your moderator today. So I'm very uh, delighted and happy to be with you. Um, so just a little bit of background about the webinar series itself. Um, so it's actually a collaboration between UNESCO, uh, MALCAP, Creative Commons, and Open Glam. Um, and it's been developed as part of the celebration of the International Day for Universal Access to Information, which of course is celebrated each uh, year on the 28th of September. So we're a little bit early, 28th is Monday, but we're, we're, we're going ahead with this first uh, opening of the webinar today. So in terms of the International Day, um, each year there is a global theme that is selected. So this year's theme is access to information, saving lives, building trust and bringing hope. So I think it's a very apt and important theme as it highlights really the role um, in this COVID-19 uh, crisis that museums, archives and uh, libraries are playing to kind of provide access online to important information that's being used for education, for policy development, for research, and I think like also for entertainment. So I've been in a couple of times in isolation and I've been um, happy and lucky to be able to access like an, a lot of museum collections across the world and take virtual tours and do research. So I think uh, we're very lucky that we have a lot of information that we can access online from memory institutions. So um, I think with this overall context, um, what these webinars are really trying to do is to support you colleagues in the Asia Pacific. Uh, I've seen the attendance list and I know many of you are working in libraries, in archives, in museums, in galleries, in all types of organizations in the Pacific, um, across Asia. So. This webinar series is really um, designed for you um, and to cater for your interest in opening up your collections um, and using open licensing frameworks and also to kind of jump on board with this message that we have around universal access to documentary heritage. So this is a very important message that we hope to leave with you after this webinar series. So there's four webinars. So um, they're gonna take place over the next month, every Friday, I think, every Friday. So don't just, please don't just join today, but try and engage with the full series because they're really interesting. We have four different topics um, and we have experts from UNESCO, Open Glam, Creative Commons and Wikimedia and many kind of case studies and examples from the region and globally that are really interesting and I'm sure you're gonna find, um, or hopefully you'll find um, engaging and worthwhile. So today's uh, webinar, we're really kicking off with the basics of open access. So what are open access principles? What are we talking about? So this will ho hopefully orientate us as we move forward with the next three um, webinars. So we have a speaker from UNESCO, Creative Commons and the Wikimedia Foundation. So I'm going to introduce each speaker a bit later on. Um, and then next Friday, uh, we're moving on to a webinar on the basics of copyright. So public licenses, Creative Commons licenses. Uh, the week following, um, we're focusing on open access and digitization. So we're going to have a speaker from Europeana, from the Asian Digital Library, and then from Wikimedia Indonesia. So we're gonna hear from some very interesting case studies and examples. And then finally, in our final um, webinar, it's really an opportunity for all of you to engage with our experts on open access. And this will be a discussion on kind of next steps forward in terms of implementing some open access principles at your own organization. 
So that's the series. Um, I think before we start, I've got a couple of just uh, kind of housekeeping issues that I'd like to share with you. So please, during the session, please mute your microphone and keep your video off. Um, and also uh, note that this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available online after this. So you can uh, watch it again if you like. Um, and in terms of the questions, we have time at the end of this webinar for a question and answer session. So please feel free to kind of post your questions in the chat box at any time. And uh, we're going to collect your questions and then ask the speakers at the end of the, the session to respond. So uh, that's the background. So I'd like to now introduce our first speaker, um, Masako Ito. And so Masako is the advisor for communication information at the UNESCO Bangkok office. And she's responsible for UNESCO's communication and information program across all of the Mekong uh, countries. Um, and she's also the focal point and the coordinator for UNESCO's Memory of the World program, which deals with documentary heritage. And Masako coordinates that across the Asia Pacific. So thank you, Masako. Um, the time is yours for your presentation. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon, dear participants, uh, representative of the memory institutions and uh, dear partners uh, from Creative Commons, uh, Open Glam, and Wikimedia Foundation. It's really a pleasure for me to speak in this webinar on the occasion of the Uni International Day for Universal Access to Information. And as you know, the COVID-19 crisis has underlined the importance of access to information. And today we are going to talk about uh, the concept of open access, uh, the basic principles, and how we can apply those principles in the cultural sectors. And what you can see, for example, here on the screen, it is a digital representation of a glass plate negative, uh, which is a negative from uh, 1903, between 1903 and 1941, uh, kept at the Department of Archaeology in Myanmar and representing one of the most prominent monument in Bagan in Myanmar. And according to the new uh, Myanmar copyright law, its copyright lasts for 50 years from the date of the creation. So this glass plate negative is in principle in the public domain, but we are now working on creating the digital representation of the plate. And it is a very interesting case study to understand what copyright is, what open access is, and how we can apply the principle of open access to the cultural sectors uh, while protecting at the same time the public interest, but also the interest of the collection holder. So uh, let me move to the next slide about what the definition of open access. So open access means free access to information and unrestricted use of electronic resources for everyone. And this applies to any type of content from text, audio, video, photography, but also data and software and it can also apply to non-intellectual uh, content like uh, music, movies, or novels. So based on these definitions, we see that all type of digitized document preserved in the memory institutions, such as libraries, archive, museum, and galleries can be in open access. Uh, let me go through uh, briefly through the history of uh, open access movements. Uh, it started uh, early uh, in the early 17th century with the first war digital library project called Gutenberg. And that was created to make freely available all the books 
in the digital uh, formats that were in the public domain. And the movement has been developed in parallel with the free and open source software movement, which uh, is also a movement to advocate for sharing uh, freely amongst the developers software source code to increase collaborations, to increase uh, sharing, and to increase uh, knowledge, knowledge creations. Uh, so the movement has uh, really uh, took off in the 90s with the advent of the internet and more and more people publishing uh, research papers online. Uh, starting from the 1993, we have seen a growth, a very rapid growth of uh, uh, expansions of uh, open access journals. Uh, with a key milestone in 2001 with the foundation of the Creative Commons, which is uh, an organization that provides uh, a tool and a legal framework to enable the sharings of copy and the development of derivative work while at the same time protecting the interest of the creators. And between 2002 and 2003, they have been three key major open access conferences, uh, which resulted in statements and declarations that helped to shape the concept and the principles of open access. And starting from 2003, we have seen a widespread development of open access policy within universities and academic institutions. And as of today, uh, in the repository of open access policies and mandate, there are over uh, more than 1,000 policies posted there across the world. So how um, can we now apply this concept of open access in the cultural sectors? And um, I like these uh, definitions, which uh, were shared uh, with me by uh, our partner from OpenGlam. And it is taken from the definitions uh, from the Smithsonian Museum. It says that uh, for cultural heritage sectors, open access normally refers to the dedication of digital reproductions of works into the public domain meaning it is free of copyright restrictions, and you can use it for any purpose, free of charge, without further permissions. And here, the word, uh, the word dedication is uh, really important because uh, it's really an act of voluntary contributions of digital representation from the collection holder to the public domain for the public interest. So let's now see uh, what are the benefits of open access. And here, um, I'm also taking benefit from uh, open access uh, to uh, online resources and uh, this is an image that uh, has already been published by the researchers under the Creative Commons licenses that you can see uh, on the bottom. And uh, I try to apply those uh, benefits to the cultural sectors. So basically, open access uh, provide more exposures for your work, for your research, for your finding. And obviously, in the glam, in the culture sector, it's provide more exposure to your collections. The practitioners can use and apply uh, the knowledge from accessing to your collections. Uh, I think there is an important example here in the culture sectors when actually uh, the, the monuments or uh, the, the monument site managers can, for example, if they can access to the photography on the site, it can actually help to do uh, in the restoration work, for example. Um, 
open access uh, enable higher references to your institution, to your collections, because it's going to be, uh, there will be a higher uh, citation rate in the publications, um, in the article, etc. Your collection can influence policy. Uh, publics can access and see your collections. And that is, uh, uh, that's, that is um, applicable from the public around the world. And most importantly, it's compliant with grant rules. Some of the projects for uh, digitizations are uh, funded by public funds, meaning that some donors uh, might put some conditions for the digitized content to be, uh, to be shared and to be visible publicly. So adopting an open access uh, policy or licensing framework allow your institution to be compliant with the grant rules. And also most importantly, taxpayers get value for money. And this is also part of uh, good practices for good governance, because when, uh, when, when we invest some public funds to do some research, uh, to, to, to digitize collections, we are using taxpayers' money. So the idea is to bring back the result of the work to the public domain so that the public can benefit from it. So based on all these value of open access, UNESCO has adopted also an open access policy in 2013. And our member states have recognized that advancement in education, science, and culture are made possible through broad and unrestricted access to research and knowledge. In line with its mission to share knowledge, UNESCO is responsible for transferring to society all its achievements and findings, especially publications, data, and resources, making them easily available to the widest possible audiences. And we apply this open access policy uh, across the organizations but also within, uh, within our institution, ac across our programs, but also within our uh, institutions. So for example, starting from July uh, 2013, all our publications are published under an open access uh, licenses. They are freely available at no cost to the readers at uh, on the online uh, UNESCO uh, digital library. Uh, you can see the screenshot there. And UNESCO also grant irrevocable right of access to copy, use, distribute, transmit, and make derivative works on two conditions, on the conditions that UNESCO is credited as the owner of the original work and on the conditions that the derivative works carry the same licensee. So most of our publications hold the CC by SA licenses, but there are also other form of licenses, for example, for, um, for non-commercial purpose, et cetera. And we are going to see all these uh, licensing frameworks uh, in the, in the next sessions, uh, next Friday. We also apply uh, the open access policy within our programs. And one of our flagship uh, program, which is uh, the Memory of the World program, has uh, a recommendations uh, concerning the preservation of and access to documentary heritage, including in digital world. So this is an important uh, standard setting document adopted by all UNESCO member states in 2015. And free and open access to documentary heritage is a central part of this, this recommendation. You can read that member states should support and promote 
public domain access and wherever possible, encourage the use of public licensing and open access solutions. And you can access to the full text uh, of the recommendations uh, on uh, our website. And uh, finally, let me finish uh, these presentations by uh, sharing how, uh, how can we apply those principles of open access uh, for the GLAM institution, which is going to be uh, the topic uh, of, the, of, the, of the presentations over the next sessions. But basically, uh, the International Open GLAM Working Group has developed in 2013 um, a set of rules as five rules that heritage institutions uh, are invited to apply to advance humanity's knowledge by opening up their collections. And I'm mentioning this because these are still uh, the key uh, milestone in, in the uh, achievement of the work of the open glam communities. One of the rules is to release digital information about artifacts into the public domain using an appropriate legal tool. So this is about the availability of the metadata. The second rule is to keep digital representation of works for which copyright has expired in the public domain by not adding new right to them when publishing data, make an explicit and robust statement of your wishes and expectation with respect to reuse and repurposing. And the Creative Commons licensing framework really allow the copyright, uh, the collection holders to do that, to, to, to express their uh, wishes and expectations. The fourth rule is when publishing data, use open file format, which are machine readable. And finally, opportunities to engage audiences in novel ways on the web should, should be pursued. So those principles are still a work in progress and are being improved, but it is worse to not, to not, to not, to not them as um, as they represent the key achievements of the open glam uh, community uh, as of today. Um, thank you very much. And uh, if I, I welcome uh, your questions uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you. So thank you very much, Masako, for your presentation. Um, now, I think we'll move on to our next uh, speaker. So our next speaker is Claudio Ruiz, who's the Director of Ecosystem Strategy at Creative Commons. Uh, previously, he was the Executive Director at Derechos Digitales, an NGO in Chile ded dedicated to human rights and technology. Um, given the time difference between Chile and Bangkok, I think it's very early in the morning in Chile, Claudio has kindly recorded his presentation in, in advance for us. But if you have any questions for Claudio um, at the end of the session, just please let us know and we will forward them to Claudio and get in touch with him um, so you can uh, engage that way. So thank you colleagues in Bangkok, please cue Claudio's presentation. My name is Claudio Ruiz and I'm the Director of Ecosystem Strategy at Creative Commons. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank UNESCO for giving me the opportunity uh, of talking with all of you today. Unfortunately, because I'm based in Santiago, this time it will be impossible for me to join you live at the conference. So we decided to record this video and I will also share the slides of the, of the presentation for being openly distributed later. In case you have any questions, I'm pretty sure that Misako, Fiona and Andrew will be ready to answer those later on. So um, I would like to start with the questions that is, that is there on the presentation, which I'm sure that must be one of the first questions to be asked when someone is first faced to the idea of open access for cultural institutions. 
why are we talking about access uh, is the right question. Isn't that exactly what our purpose as an institution is? So if we're already providing access, if galleries, libraries, archives, and museums are, have open doors, and uh, they've been doing that for years and decades, so why are we talking about something else? And in particular, what are we talking about open? So I want to try to discuss this uh, this question during the upcoming minutes, and I hope to be successful on that. So let's start with access. Um, as I said, currently, all galleries, libraries, museums, and archives provide access to cultural artifacts and cultural heritage at a large scale. That's, of course, part of their mission and, uh, and, and the reason to exist in the first place, too. Um, but the question that I would like us to ask ourselves is whether that kind of access, the access that we used to give in our uh, real spaces that we have as a museum, is enough on the digital environment. When we are connecting that access, that physical access, with the digital environment that we have all over the place today, is when other questions are raised, uh, but also opportunities appears, of course, for providing even more access to that to those people. So, for instance, cultural institutions are probably the major contributors today to the open web. Digitization have been provided a new platform to precisely achieve their objectives and goals as institutions. See, for example, uh, Wikimedia Commons or CC Search. They are providing visibility to millions of works that originally are within the museum's collections. Or take the example of the Smithsonian Institute, um, where in February of 2020, they released over 2.8 million of images there in the public domain. So the question, in a way, seems to be what does it mean to provide access in the context of a digitized and connected world? And this is important because we are not just talking about the public that used to be the, the, the audience that cultural institutions has, but also when you were talking about digital objects, we we're also talking about educators, for instance, or people who are willing to do a little bit more than just go into a place and look at cultural objects around. So when cultural institute, heritage sorry, institutions are trying to provide that access online, it's not an easy task. And actually, there are, in principle, two forces in place that are sometimes in conflict when it's about providing that digital access or open access, as we are going to call it later on, uh, there. So for, from one side, uh, all of what is related with digitization efforts is there. So you have the need of equipment, you need, the, you need some standards for digitization work, you need documentation, you need to write the right metadata, etc. And these kind of things are especially hard in places like the Global South, where institutions doesn't have all the internal resources for dealing with uh, some of these challenges as the Smithsonian Institute has, for instance, or the Med Museum in New York has, or some museums in Europe may have. And from the other side, you have copyright. Copyright sometimes can be a huge barrier for providing just enough access to cultural objects, as I will explain further uh, on. There are plenty of questions connected with digitization and access that copyright needs to be able to answer. For instance, is an image that we have there in the public domain already? Are we as institutions legally allowed to provide this access to the further public? Do we have enough protection in our local law to avoid problems related with this uncertainty that copyright law provides to us? So, in a way, copyright is not always there when cultural institutions provide physical access to their collections. You don't, you're not dealing necessarily all day long with copyright uh, problems or these kind of questions when you're providing access to the collections itself. But when that access is provided online, it triggers copyright regulation because copyright is a legal framework for regulating use and reuse of works. 
as of, I'm pretty sure that my colleagues will explain further in the second round table today. So the question that, that is there in the presentation, I think is critical. Like, why do we need to ask copyright law or permissions for doing what we are doing for centuries as institutions? How different is this online access with the kind of access that we have been providing for decades? So in short, the reason is quite simple, uh, because when it's by digital means, every time that you're accessing a work, meaning in a PDF format or in an image or in a document, you are using it, the, sorry, you are using, you, your use means that you or a machine are making a copy of it. You are making a reproduction. When you're working on the internet, every time that you are uh, accessing something or you're using a work of others, you are making, you are a machine uh, for the sake of the argument are making a copy. And when you're making a copy, meaning a reproduction, that means that by default, every time that there's a copy of a protected work, that copy requires a permission. That's what copyright regulation said by general principle. So while on the GLAM institution to watch a work, to read a document is just a news, on internet, every use implies a copy. And that means that every copy means permission. And that's the reason why copyright is so important as a barrier for open access. And if you, you need to add up that certain particularities that copyright regulation has. For instance, the copyright is an extremely complicated legal framework. It's really difficult to grasp, grasp it completely in an easy way because you have different layers of protection that sometimes do not talk each other. Secondly, there's really difficult to give certainties for the public interest for several reasons, but some of them is connected because of the way that copyright regulation is being uh, drafted during the last decades, where is the interest of the copyright owners apparently uh, the one that are being the driving force for the regulation during the last years. Also, the public domain as a concept is, of course, homo homo homogenized somehow, but it's not necessarily clear that works that are in the public domain in certain countries are also in the public domain in others, because the regulation of the public domain or the, the boundaries of the copyright regulation is not necessarily clear based on this extremely complicated legal framework that I mentioned before. And of course, neither exceptions and limitations, meaning permissions that the law gives to the people to use uh, some um, uh, to use some to use part of the of, of these copyrighted works are not necessarily homogenized either around the world. So if copyright is one barrier for providing access and to enable the mission that cultural institution has, maybe it's time to tweak it for good. And tweak the copyright in this particular sense means open. That's exactly the meaning of open, at least in the sense of the open glam that we're speaking about today. So it's um, this is a critical concept. The open access concept is a critical concept because uh, for being used on digital objects, because they are by design prompt to be used and reused, as I said before. When you, an open access policy means giving access to the people to access, of course, but also use and also reuse a digital work that has been digitized already. So with an open access policy, we are providing not just access in the sense of physical access to objects, but also allowing further distributions. In terms of open access, what we're doing is that we're using copyright, but tweaking it a little bit for offering access that is meaningful in the digital space. Access in the means of digital, digital sorry, is strictly connected with the ability of using and reuse because there's no way of accessing a digital object without using it, as I said before, at least uh, in the sense of copyright. So uh, open access in a way means to make not just knowledge, but information, culture, and even research and every other uh, cultural objects available online without a price or permission barriers. And this is very important because uh, open access may have different meanings, but this uh, concept that I'm uh, explaining here, at least to me, makes a lot of sense in terms of um, providing a landscape of the regulation and how open access is important for uh, cultural institutions as glams. Of course, there's main, there's, there may be other barriers different than price of permission for 
accessing work. So for instance, filtering sometimes censorship, a language barrier, connectivity and whatnot. But in terms of, uh, or under the lens of copyright, uh, it's important to consider that open access means to make all of that content available online without price or permission barriers. And this is where Creative Commons enters to the picture because Creative Commons provides the licenses and the public domain tools um, and the copyright expertise for course that can help accomplish these goals with the shared mission of growing the commons of knowledge and culture. And I'm pretty sure that the CC licenses, the PD mark and CC0 may be complex for some of you, but my colleague Brigitte will speak about this further. I'm pretty sure about it. I'm sorry, Brigitte, <laughs> on the next round table. But the important part for the sake of this conversation is that these are tools that are being provided in the open and for free for cultural institutions and, and, uh, and people also to allow the copyright and to tweak the copyright, sorry, to allow the right access that we need for digital objects. But Creative Commons is not just about licenses, it's also a community. And the reason is because you're not changing the world and locking access to digital culture and heritage, just drafting a set of copyright licenses, of course. You mostly do that with the help of your friends and colleagues that have, that have a shared understanding of the importance of enlarging the works in the public domain and help others implementing these open access policies, sharing experiences and also challenges together. And that's more or less the purpose of the openglam.org project that we are very proud to host. And, and I'm sure that other colleagues will explain a little bit further about that later on. But I would like to say that openglam.org is currently then an open invitation, open in the sense of copyright, uh, invitation to people to just participate into this. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to close this uh, brief uh, presentation. The first is the Open Glam Medium uh, um, publication, which is a collaborative publication about global insights on open access and cultural heritage in different languages with different perspectives and inviting people to share the experiences of the on the challenges too of digitizing works of their collection in different contexts. So it's really important for us because this provides stories from the world. And it's really important to provide this global vision in terms of to have a more wide understanding regarding the need of having a, a, an active community that is working on this field. And the second example that I would like to share with you is the collective Twitter account for sharing content, but with a different perspective. For instance, in the case of the Twitter account, this is a, um, a screenshot that I took just uh, this week. You will see that uh, every week or every two weeks, there's different um, uh, users that we are inviting to curate the Twitter account of the at OpenGlam uh, account. And, uh, and the reason is because at the same, in the same way that the Medium publication is willing to provide a global, global audience and a global perspective regarding uh, uh, open access policies, the same is true with the Twitter account and we're super proud of being uh, working on that matter. So I'm, I'm going to end here because it's really important for me to connect the need of tweaking the copyright as a challenge to use open access policies within institutions because of the importance of use and reuse, but also important is to connect with the community. And that's more or less what Open Glam is trying to do. And we are, uh, again, we're super proud of uh, helping into this matter, but also is an invitation for all of you, not just to visit these uh, links that I'm putting there, but also to join us in the conversation and to move this barrier further. I'm going to be ending there. Thank you so much. And in case you have any questions, that those are my contact. That's my email and my Twitter account. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. See you around. Okay, great. So we've just heard from Claudio. He gave a very nice presentation for us. And he also importantly gave us an open invitation to engage in open clan. So I think um, there's so many exciting uh, Kind of initiatives that he shared with us so i think we can follow on the twitter and then we can discuss further um, about claudio's presentation later on so i'd like to introduce um, our final speaker for the webinar today so fiona romeo who's the senior manager of galleries libraries archives and museums and culture at the wikimedia foundation so 
So Fiona previously worked at the Wellcome Collection and the Museum of Modern Art. So thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for your time to, um, to share with us your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today um, in, as part of the first webinar in this series. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the earlier speakers, Masako and Claudio, for their very clear concept of open access, which I hope you have now understood. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the benefit of that open access in relation to the projects of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, where, where I work. Uh, so our mission is to imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. I'd like to particularly hone in on the phrase freely share. And in this case, freely share really requires open access. We want to share all of our projects and all of our content openly. So we need all of the content within our projects to be open to so that we can do so. And when I was trying to understand more about the UNESCO's documentary, documentary heritage program, I found this really beautiful uh, summary of what they're trying to achieve. So documentary heritage records the unfolding of human thought and events, the evolution of languages, cultures, peoples, and their understanding of the world. So if we want to present at Wikimedia the sum of all human knowledge, we need documentary heritage. We need these resources to really make that possible. And I have a quote here from uh, the first Wikimedian in residence in 2010, Liam Wyatt, a sort of Wikimedia volunteer, uh, took up residence at the British Museum to try to bring glam institutions, galleries, libraries, archives and museums into conversation with the Wikimedia movement. And I just loved what he said. We are doing the same thing for the same reason in the same medium. Let's do it together. And that's really what the Open Glam movement is trying to achieve as well. Um, so just very briefly, uh, I've talked about the Wikimedia Foundation. Probably the project you're most familiar with is Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia that can be edited by anyone. It's one of the most visited websites in the world. It's the most visited non-commercial website in the world. So in terms of like our shared public domain of, of knowledge and culture, it's one of the most important sites there is. Um, but I'm not just gonna talk about Wikipedia today because there are other projects of the Wikimedia Foundation that are similar to Wikipedia, um, but make other collaborations with memory institutions possible. So I'm gonna talk about Wikimedia Commons, I'm gonna talk about Wikidata, and I'm gonna talk about Wikisource as well a little bit today. So I mentioned earlier that Wikipedia is one of the most important websites in the world. Um, just to give you a sense of the sort of access and reach that Wikipedia provides, we had 21 billion page views uh, in the month of August. Um, so it's a heavily visited, heavily trafficked site and an important resource uh, for everyone. But it's also a global community. So just as Claudio says, it's not just in this case about websites that everyone can visit and contribute to. It's about a community of practice. It's about people coming together, working towards shared goals and trying to make everyone's knowledge, everyone's culture and everyone's languages visible, available, editable and, and used by everyone. And one of the most important relationships within this community is that relationship between the volunteers who work on Wikimedia projects, the Wikimedians, collaborating with memory institutions, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, um, and all of those united by the common goal of preserving cultural heritage and sharing knowledge with the world. Um, and since these partnerships started in the early sort of 2000s, we've developed hundreds of partnerships around the world. I'm going to share today six of the ways that memory institutions can contribute to and benefit from Wikimedia projects. Um, but there is 
you know, there is no shortage of experimentation and, and different models that people take um, because it's open. Everyone can bring their own perspective and their own approaches. But I'll talk about six of the most common ways that memory institutions work with the Wikimedia movement. The first one is what I sort of mentioned earlier with that quote from Liam. It's this model of Wikimedians, Wikimedia volunteers, in residence. So this is one of our most tried and tested approaches. Um, a Wikimedian in residence is usually an experienced Wikipedia editor who is embedded within an institution to build that institution's collaboration with the Wikimedia movement. The engagement is usually a long one. Um, it typically lasts for at least six months, but in some cases uh, can go on for years. And sometimes these Wikimedians have actually ended up becoming permanent members of staff. And these individuals provide the vital bridge between Wikimedia and open access communities and the practices and perspectives of the institution. By working within the institution alongside staff, they understand their particular needs and challenges and they're able more effectively to connect that to the Wikimedia projects and, and find ways of, of working together. They act as guides, facilitators and advocates to support collaboration. Uh, with an institution staff and curators, as I mentioned, but also inviting in the public and inviting them to take part in these projects too. In many ways, they embody this process of institutional knowledge becoming open knowledge. Another model that's been used around the world very successfully is the model of an editathon. Um, so this is when a memory institution um, hosts uh, volunteers, Wikimedia volunteers and their existing audience and brings them together to work on a shared goal. Uh, these used to happen uh, on site, so within the institutions themselves. We've seen this year uh, with everything that's happening, that model is increasingly shifted online so that this work can still happen. But libraries, archives and museums have always been sites of knowledge production. So Wikipedia editathons put their reading rooms and study spaces to a new use within this longstanding tradition, creating a broad point of entry for sharing institutional knowledge and expertise into Wikimedia communities. These events have helped grow Wikipedia, expand the reach of collections, and have brought countless new contributors into our movement. The widespread reach of initiatives like Art and Feminism, which is shown here, Wiki Loves Women and Afro Crowd Projects, for example, embody the persuasiveness of these kinds of activities. You see here an example uh, of an editathon which was organized by the UNESCO Bangkok office. It was organized in 2019 with Wiki for Women, um, with Wikimedians in Thailand, and it was a celebration of International Women's Day. And a typical editathon usually starts with training in Wikipedia editing. So staff, visitors, volunteers come together and learn all of the shared practices around how to contribute to Wikipedia. There's typically a work list of pages that need to be edited. And these are often tied to a theme like the visibility of women, for example. Um, we would call these content gaps on Wikipedia, like areas where we feel that certain knowledge or certain people are underrepresented. And editathons are a great way of specifically addressing those gaps. The host institution will typically provide a space and they'll also bring out some of their resources like books, manuscripts and other sources that can be used for the editing work um, that then become part of, of Wikipedia. Another really important activity, the third activity of the six I'm gonna talk about today is image uploads. So this is when an institution takes works that are already in the public domain, produces a digital reproduction of those works and then shares them openly, including uploading them to one of the Wikimedia platforms, uh, which Claudia mentioned earlier, Wikimedia Commons, which hosts images that are then available for reuse on other Wikimedia projects, but also elsewhere. 
And the sharing and reuse of images and other media files via Commons has allowed cultural institutions to take advantage of that broad public audience on Wikipedia that I mentioned earlier. And so much so that we've seen every kind of organization from the massive National Archives of the United States, Smithsonian, as Claudio mentioned, or the Metropolitan Museum, to more specialized institutions like the Ethnographic Troppen Museum in the Netherlands, or small research collections like that of the Museum of Veterinary Anatomy in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And they can all, by joining on this platform, enjoy access to a global audience. Um, I hope this graph is clear, um, but what it's showing is the comparison in red of the views that artworks on the Met Museum's own website get compared to the views that they get when they're incorporated on the English language Wikipedia article, and then when they're included on Wikipedia articles in all languages. So as one of the most visited websites in the world, Wikipedia offers a lot of, as is often sort of crudely said, eyeballs for institutional content. And as more institutions have recognized that reach beyond their walls, beyond even their own institutional websites, through Wikimedia and other platforms is a powerful way to achieve their missions. More and more of them have adopted open access policies, removing all barriers to reuse of their public domain content and adopting open licenses for their collections that they are legally able to share. And often our communities on the ground in places like Indonesia and Argentina and India are actually helping institutions to digitize their materials to get them ready for this release. Another project uh, that I'm going to share, and this is the another example of the collaborations you can have with Wikimedia, is Wikidata. And it's kind of a Wikipedia of data. It provides a general framework for people sharing metadata, vocabularies, and languages used by institutions to describe their collections. And this offers up new possibilities for people discovering what's there, but also connecting collections across the different institutional repositories and telling a broader story about our collections. So the one example I'm gonna share of this is the sum of all paintings. Um, this is a glam project in our community, which is aiming to create a comprehensive catalog of all the paintings in the world. Um, and through the community's efforts, there's now a growing group of more than a quarter of a million paintings on Wikidata um, that all use the same language and are connected together. Communities are also using Wikidata to document performing arts, film, natural heritage, and much more. Uh, but as this uh, map, which was generated using Wikidata shows, um, while we're building greater connection and understanding across the world, this map also shows what's missing. There are collections, institutions, cultures, and perspectives that aren't yet very well um, populated across Wikimedia projects. So this is a map of all of the works in the Sum of All Paintings uh, corpus tagged with a geo coordinate. And here you can see um, that there are large clusters and big metropolitan areas in North America and Europe. So by collecting the most accessible collections, those that already have open policies and, and well-funded technology teams, our community has captured only one layer of our collective art history. There is so much that is still missing. So we begin to see the gaps, whether it's the missing representation of glam collections, uh, memory institutions collections from entire continents like Africa, or recognizing that a small proportion of biographies on English Wikipedia are about women, or that many registered public monuments outside of Europe and North America are legacies of a colonial era, or that indigenous people in their cultures make up only a tiny fraction of Wikimedia content. So we want to support more people and institutions to join our movement. And one of the really great projects that helps with this, and this is the last example I'm gonna share, is the ability to actually share books and other text-based works on Wikisource. 
so you create a digital reproduction of these documents and you share them on Wikisource where the community can then transcribe them. And they could even be exported as eBooks that people can read on other devices. So this platform is particularly important for our emerging communities like the Bengali Wikimedians in building fully searchable and citable digital libraries to grow open knowledge about their culture and text and to revitalize their own languages. Um, this is a, a photograph of a gathering of the Punjabi Wikimedia community. They uploaded over 200 works of first editions, manuscripts to Punjabi Wikisource. And these works were then available to be cited and incorporated on Wikipedia projects, addressing one of those gaps in representation and language on our projects. Thank you for your time and attention. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for your great presentation. Um, we now have some time uh, for question and answer. So I've got actually two questions um, that we can start with. Um, please feel free to keep adding um, the questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. But I think we'll start with the question from Mohammed, and he's um, asked a question about copyright which we're gonna cover in more detail uh, next Friday. But this question here is, um, when copyright is to regulate certain capital extraction in information production, how is it possible for taxpayers to get the benefits uh, money when open access means free from price? So I guess this, maybe this is a question for Fiona and Masako, whoever would like to answer it. Um, and I think we can also revisit this next Friday when we're going to go into a deep dive on copyright issues, a more technical session. So I'm not sure Fiona or Masako, if you'd like to respond to this. So I think Masako, will you respond? Yes. So yes. So I think uh, this is a question related to one of the slides that I presented as one of the benefits of uh, open access. And I was actually referring to the sum of the research uh, project or research grant that uh, is provided by the government using public funds. And if the finding, so, so, so without open access, uh, the public actually has to pay twice. They had to pay for funding the research, but then for accessing uh, accessing the, the finding or the result of the research. I mean, that's happened, for example, when uh, government has uh, funded some research on, uh, on drugs and medical research and some big uh, pharmacy, uh, big pharmacy. Uh, put some uh, copyright in uh, in generating the, the the medicine, and instead of releasing under the generic, so uh, that also applies to uh, in the field of uh, um, uh, research uh, papers. Um, so uh, the, the benefits is not in terms of the bonnet, but the benefit is in terms of access because you can actually see uh, the result of your uh, contribution as a taxpayer to uh, the public funds. Maybe uh, I'm not sure if uh, um, Fiona wants to um, complement my answer. I, th I think you answered it very well. I think I would have just said that there are different types of value um, that sort of come out of making these works available. So it, it makes it available to people for their own creative and, and intellectual reuse. So they can take be find benefit in, in using it. But I, th I think what you said, Masako, captured it very well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we have a question now from Mira. So Mira says, open access means information from archives available online without a price or permission barrier in standard resolution. But her question is, what if the uh, user wants to have a very high resolution 
um, image for a publication or an exhibition, is it possible to put a price on that for that special use, not just the standard image, but the high resolution image? I don't know, Fiona, would you like to respond first and then perhaps Masako could add on to that? Yes, many institutions that have open access policies will still charge like an administration fee uh, for making those larger resolution files available for reuse in, in other formats. Some choose not to charge for that either, but it is possible to have an open access policy and still charge an ad admin fee for some of those services. Thanks, Fiona. Masaka, would you like to add to that or you? Um, well, yeah, I agree with, uh, with the answer uh, given by Fiona. Okay. So we now have a question from uh, Tin Ai from uh, Myanmar. So um, she says that she's found some very rare photos that have been posted on Facebook and Instagram for the public. So some photos are family photos in which they can, you can see the dress style from the 1960s and 70s. So the question is, if we want to use this photos for research, do we need to request um, permission to this account or can we use it freely? Is this, can this be called open access? So this is her question. So I'm... Um, Fiona, would you like to? Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that when people share content on those platforms in particular, Facebook and Instagram, they're not by sharing it, um, attaching an open license to it. So they would have to explicitly do that as a separate step um, in order to say that they were happy for people to open license it. I think this touches on another sort of complex issue around consent. So the consent of people um, who are depicted in pictures and, and the new version of the Open Glam Declaration will have more to say about this kind of question of consent of the people whose like culture or lives are depicted in, in, these, in these pictures. Okay, thank you, Fiona. Masaka, would you like to add uh, to yes. that or is that? Um, yes, I mean you can you cannot um, you cannot normally uh, use it freely. You have to request for permission unless it is uh, openly uh, licenses. And also, uh, there are some uh, copyright law in uh, Myanmar, which uh, which also says that uh, you know if the photograph has been. Um, the copyright for photography, I think, taken by the government lasts for 50 years. But if it was taken by uh, uh, an individual, it lasts for 50 years after the death of the creator. So uh, it's very complex. And unless you ask explicitly uh, what's about the permission, you wouldn't know if you can use it freely or not. And and maybe, uh, yeah, you, you can be sued in, uh, in a few uh, years about by using some photos. So you have to ask permissions normally. Okay. So thank you, Masako and Fiona. Um, we have here uh, just a comment um, and an invitation for collaboration. So this is from the Museum, Music, uh, Museum of Music in Indonesia. And I would like to say thank you for receiving the Malkap Asia Culture Center grant. Um, so they were awarded this grant, a small grant to digitize um, content. So this is an Indonesian music magazine, a very important magazine from the 1960s to the 1970s. So they're looking forward for collaboration with GLAM, Creative Commons and Wikimedia Foundation. So I think this is, uh, I think uh, probably a timely seminar. So I hope this is of use once you've digitized your content at the Museum of Music to, to look at what licenses, open license you can apply to share this very important co uh, collection more widely. Um, so I have another question here from an anonymous attendee. So it's directed towards Fiona. So does uh, Wikimedia monetize any of the data? So this is a question or is it, yeah, this is a question 
Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we don't sell any of our data. We don't run any advertising. So we don't have commercial interest in the content in that sense. The foundation that stewards Wikipedia and other projects is entirely funded by donations and primarily uh, small donations from the sort of millions of people who use and contribute to Wikimedia projects. Okay, thanks, Fiona. Um, another question here from Adi, who's from the National Archives of Indonesia. Um, so Adi asks, for an open access policy, how do we address issues that impact on, uh, uh, for, sorry, how do we balance public access with issues such as national security, privacy, and business competition? So I think this is a kind of important question. Where is this balance between this. So maybe I can ask Masako to share um, uh, so her response first, and then perhaps after that, Fiona, if you'd like to add. Um, so uh, the open access policy is uh, basically a voluntary contributions from uh, the copyright holder or the you know information owner to share the to share the information publicly. So obviously, if you are uh, holding information of national security, privacy, or business competitions, uh, you are not you are not deciding to share it, sharing it is publicly. There are also cases of uh, declassifications of uh, official public record relating to the state security after uh, a number of years under the, um, under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but I think that's, uh, that's a different um, topic uh, from open access. I, I would just add to that to say that um, usually when people start working with the Wikimedia movement and projects, they don't do what we described the Smithsonian doing, which is like to make 2.8 million images available. Typically people start with a smaller set of images or resources that they feel very confident about the public domain status of those works and they can see a clear public interest and appetite for sharing them. So I think you don't, it, it's not all or nothing. Um, particularly when you're starting out. So most institu institutions start with a couple of smaller contributions and then um, as they see the benefit of that and as their confidence grows, they, they sort of can open it up more broadly. But of course, there will always be materials that fall outside of um, either you don't have the copyright or there are other issues around making them fully available. Okay, thanks, Fiona. Um... We have uh, two questions from Sander. So the first question is, if institutions establish open access repositories, should all resources have a CC license in the repository? So that's the first question. The second is, what is the difference between CC 4.0 and CC 3.0 and how can we apply it? So these are two questions from Sander. So Fiona, would you like to respond so this one first, or Masako? Well, I can respond to the but, first questions. Uh, yes. Which is, uh, if the institution establish open access repository, uh, yes, all the resources have to be uh, CC licenses or in the public domain, so without uh, any uh, copyright. Or the copyright has expired, so it's in the public domain. For oh, the second questions, uh, I'm not able to uh, to explain the differences. For the second question, just uh, I'd remind everyone. So next week we're going to have a deep dive on the Creative Commons licenses. So next fr Friday is dedicated specifically for this topic in more detail. But if you know you'd like to add anything further to that, or we can continue on next week. So. I, I think it would be best for Creative Commons okay. to answer yeah. that one. So let's let's all tune in next Friday for that. That's a bit of a teaser for next next week. Um, just I think we've just about run out of time, but I saw there's like a nice um, exchange about Wikimedia Foundation volunteers. So 
I think we're going to have a speaker from Wikimedia Indonesia in our third week who are doing really fantastic work with a lot of volunteers. But maybe Fiona, would you just like to just share a little bit about some of the initiatives there and um, uh, is there opportunities for organisations who want to work with Wikimedia Foundation for volunteers in the Asia Pacific? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question about the sort of capacity and availability of volunteers within this um, pandemic and, and also like maybe how ways of working have shifted. So, you know, the answer to that question is kind of different depending on where you are. But we have seen in some places like a large growth in activity because with the pivot to digital, lots more cultural institutions are trying to work out how to move away from their primarily sort of physical access model to making more of their materials available online to their sort of former visitors, but also for educational purposes. So in some cases we've seen like a real flourishing of activity as cultural institutions are engaging more. Um, obviously our Wikimedians or our volunteers have had to change their ways of working. So digitization in particular has been affected. So there were a number of digitization initiatives that were planned that are kind of on pause now as you know buildings are shut and everyone's social distancing. So some initiatives have changed, but as a result, we've seen a lot more happening online, um, which sometimes has meant better attendance because it's easier for people to sort of fit it within their day. Um, and it's also more possible to collaborate sort of between countries and, and different locations when everyone's working online. Um, so I would say, yes, volunteers are still available and active. Most of the activity has shifted online. Um, and I'm just really careful, you know, not just with volunteers, with everyone right now, that when I'm asking someone to do something, I'm really mindful of the fact that everyone has a lot going on right now and their capacity might be the set, might not be what it was kind of before. So I think it's just important to check on that. Um, there was a specific question about how to get an initiative started. And I think in some locations, we have really well established national chapters like Wikimedia Indonesia, who will be presenting soon. That's not the case in every country. And so we have, um, I'm gonna share it to the chat, but we have a general email address for anyone who wants to get in touch uh, to start talking about potential collaborations. So that's glam at wikimedia.org. It will come to me and my colleagues and we can respond to any specific questions you have, either connecting you to your national chapter or affiliate, individual volunteers or helping you directly ourselves. Okay, thanks for that Fiona. I think we've just about run out of time or just, I saw there's a, a question or a comment from Erna in Myanmar about the Myanmar Education Research and Learning Portal um, who are using a CCBY license. So I think maybe we can revisit that discussion next week for this Creative Commons. So it would be really fantastic to learn more about what is going on with the Myanmar Education Research and Learning Portal. Perhaps next week, possibly we can discuss it um, in our Creative Commons uh, session, which will take place next Friday. Um, so I guess uh, we're run out of time. So I'd just like to finish by just thanking all of our speakers who have joined us for their time. And also importantly, um, all of you, the participants who have joined um, from across the Asia Pacific um, and for your very interesting questions and engagement. So um, I hope you can see this on the screen. Um, just a reminder, please join again next Friday at the same time. Um, and if you could um, kindly complete a very short survey, um, you can uh, get the QR, scan the QR code on your screen, on your phone, if you like now, or um, you can actually access this link. I think it will be posted in the discussion chat. So you can click on that. So we'd be very grateful if you can respond to that. Also, we have a wider survey that I think was sent through when you registered about your knowledge of Open Glam. So I think we had um, quite a good uh, kind of response to the survey, but not everyone completed it. So we'd really be grateful if you could um, take some time to finish that. And it's, I think, very, very important um, 
I know there was a global survey from Open Glam, which was conducted in 2018. Um, and then in terms of responses, like overwhelmingly, uh, the responses were from Europe and North America, with I think only 4% respond, response from the Asia Pacific uh, region, and actually uh, no responses from Africa. So I think we really need to kind of hear your voice about what's going on at your memory institutions across the region and kind of, um, yeah, we can uh, yeah, understand what's going on uh, a bit further, hopefully through the data that you can provide in these surveys. So um, please, if you have a chance, complete that survey. So I think that's all from me. Um, looking forward to seeing you all uh, next Friday. Thank you.